Well, it's a joy and delight to be together as the Lord's people. Uh, thank you if you're here as a visitor. It's, uh, it's lovely to have you. May you be blessed as we are, as we worship the Lord together. Um, our brother Othniel, old Othniel uh, Chrissy, will lead us in our worship uh, this afternoon, and may the Lord bless him in that. And we forgot to do something this morning. I've just been reminded, and we didn't do the photo, did we? So for for COVID tracing, so there's a bit of a blip there. So we will do that. Uh, after the service, so if you remain seated for that. And uh, now we will prepare for worship as we sing Selection 98B as we remain seated. Good evening and uh, welcome again. As we, uh, as we join in worship, let's prepare our hearts now with a moment of uh, personal and silent prayer. Lord, we pray that you would bless our preparations for worship now, that you would be glorified in this hour. In Jesus, amen. Please uh, stand now as we're called to worship. <clears throat> and our call to worship this evening comes from the words of Isaiah 55. Come, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He who has no money, come buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money and without price. Why do you spend money for that which is not bread and your labor for that which does not satisfy? Listen diligently to me and eat what is good. Delight yourselves in rich food. Behold, you shall call a nation that you do not know and a nation that did not know you shall run to you because of the Lord your God and of the Holy One of Israel for he has glorified you. Our call to worship speaks of receiving from God that which satisfies. And as we have heard, we don't come with our own money. We don't come with our own resources to buy the satisfaction that God gives. We don't come to worship in order to show God how faithful we are. But rather we come as nothing. We come with nothing. Confessing that our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And our Lord great greets us with these words, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, let's praise uh, God now with the words of hymn 151, 
Glory be to God the Father. And after this, we'll remain standing to confess our faith with the Apostles' uh, Creed. But let's sing now 151. We confess our faith this evening with the words of the Apostles' Creed, and if uh, we don't know that, we'll find that on page six in the front of your uh, songbook. But let's say together now, with, uh, with echoing the words of the Church throughout history. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe a holy Catholic Church the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, let's, uh, let's praise God now with the verses of uh, number 145, uh, verses 1 to 5. I will exalt my God and King.
Well, uh, let's be seated now, and I'll lead us in a time of uh, congregational prayer. Uh, just reading those, those last few lines, they stood out to me there. Your, your open hand is bountiful, and every need you satisfy. I pray to him now. Let's come and pray. Our Lord and Father, as we have just sung, we praise you that you are rich in grace. You are slow to anger. You are overflowing with love and kindness. Your whole creation knows your care, from the tiniest things to the largest animals. They all exist because you have given them life. You keep them in life. All people, regardless of whether or not they acknowledge you as the giver of their life, have their life from you. So we praise you for your kindness to us as a race. You are not like us. You show your kindness to all even though so many reject the idea that you exist. Lord, give us a good memory, for you know that we are quick to forget your kindness to us. We pray that you would be honoured through the work you have done in our lives. Open the eyes of our hearts to know you. May relationship with you, our gracious Father, affect and shape who we are and how we see the world around us. So we pray for ourselves that the way we work, the way we talk, the things we do we do for those around us would reflect who you are. Lord, be glorified in us, we pray. Be glorified through us. Lord, we pray for those we work with, with neighbours and others, that they would understand something of who you are through our interactions with them. Give us opportunities and give us boldness to witness to the hope of the gospel in all our interactions with them. We pray for the mission work that goes on around us, for those who work at the universities of this city in evangelism. We pray that you would bless their work, give them perseverance and strength, give them boldness, and may your truth speak through their words to bring both conviction, conviction of sin, and also hope to those they address. Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to needs around us. The society that we are a part of is a lonely place to many. And that loneliness and and neediness is often hidden. So help us to see those around us who are suffering. Give us hearts of compassion to love them, just as you have shown us your love. We pray for the the various camps that are being prepared for at this time of the year in our denomination. May they be a blessing to those who attend and strengthen and build up your church through these things. We pray particularly for the young people of our churches. May they particularly be brought to know you, to love you through these camps. Lord, some who were, who were with us do not worship with us anymore because they've turned away from you. We pray that you, in mercy, would turn them back to yourself. Use whatever means uh, to bring them back to see you as the only hope, the only satisfaction of their need. And as we have interactions with them, help us to be wise in the words that we choose and wins them also. Lord, be merciful and bring them back to yourself. We thank you also for the word as it comes to us each Sunday and as we, as we read it for ourselves. Lord, show us yourself through it. Help us to depend on it, to drink from it, to live off it as we see you displayed in your word. Lord, please bless us also in our search for a pastor and fulfill our need in your time, we pray. These things, Lord, we pray in Jesus, our Saviour. Amen. Well, this evening we have a a couple of readings, and and first of all we're going to turn to Genesis uh, 15. You'll find that in in page 10 if you've picked up a Bible at the door. Um, And our text uh, for this evening will be uh, verse 6, Genesis 15. Now, some time ago, uh, you may remember, I read a sermon uh, based on, on chapter 14, Uh, We heard about uh, the rescue mission of Abram to save uh, Lot. 
And that rescue mission was uh, followed by an interaction with uh, Abram and the shadowy figure of Melchizedek. Um, and this time, rather than dealing with a whole chapter, we're uh, going to the opposite extreme and we're just dealing with one verse, just verse 6. It's a, it's a key verse uh, in the Old Testament, um, but we'll also be reflecting on, on Romans 4, and that has a lot to say uh, about uh, what verse 6 means. Uh, but I'll just uh, we'll read the whole chapter, uh, chapter 15 of Genesis now. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Fear not, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, Behold, you have given me no offspring, and a member of my household will be my heir. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, your very own son shall be your heir. And he brought him outside and said, Look toward heaven and number the stars, if you are able to number them. Then he said to him, So shall your offspring be. And he believed the Lord, and he counted it to him as righteousness. And he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you out from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. And he brought him all these, cut them in half, and laid each half over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in half. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. And as the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell on Abram. And behold, dreadful and great darkness fell upon him. Then the Lord said to Abram, Know for certain that your offspring will be sojourners in a land that is not theirs, and will be servants there, and they will be afflicted for four hundred years. But I will bring judgment on the nations that they serve, and afterward they shall come out with great possessions. As for yourself, you shall go to your fathers in peace. You shall be buried in a, in a good old age. And they shall come back here in the fourth generation, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet complete. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, behold, a smoking firepot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your offspring I give this land, from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates the land of the Kenites, the Kenizzites, the Cadmonites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Rephaim, the Amorites, the Canaanites, the Girgashites, and the Jebusites. Well, uh, secondly, now let's turn in our Bibles to uh, Romans chapter 4. And again, if you have a, a church Bible, that's page 941, I believe. And this um, provides us uh, with a commentary um, about the significance of, of what we've just read about in, in Genesis 15, particularly uh, verse four, verse 6 of Genesis 15. Romans 4, and I'll be reading uh, verses 1 to 17. What then we sh shall we say was gained by Abraham, our forefather, according to the flesh? For if Abraham was justified by works, he has something to boast about, but not before God. For what does the scripture say? Abraham, Abraham believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom 
the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing then only for the circumcised or also for the uncircumcised? We say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteousness. How then was it counted to him? Was it before or after he had been circumcised? It was not after, but before he was circumcised. He received the sign of circumcision as a seal of the righteousness that he had by faith while he was still uncircumcised. The purpose was to make him the father of all who believe without being circumcised, so that righteousness would be counted to them as well. And to make him the father of the circumcised, who are not merely circumcised, but who also walk in the footsteps of the faith that our father Abraham had before he was circumcised. For the promise to Abraham and his offspring that he would be heir of the world, did not come through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. For if it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void. For, For the law brings wrath, but where there is no law, there will be no transgression. This is why it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring, not only to the adherent of the law, but also to the one who shares the faith of Abram, who is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you the father of many nations in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Well, so far, the reading of God's word. And as we uh, come to the explanation of the word, now let's uh, bow our heads in prayer for understanding. Our Lord and Heavenly Father, Lord, give us understanding as we seek to understand your word and understand how we are right with you. Lord, show us the ways in which we may be relying on what is false, on what we have invented for ourselves, even as we seek you sincerely. Lord, show us the Christ in whom we are to put our faith. Give us a clear picture of how we are to believe in him. Open your word to us. Open our hearts to your word now, we pray in Jesus. I mean. Well, beloved uh, congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, I should note uh, that this is a sermon uh, that was prepared by the Reverend uh, Peter Closterman of the Reformed Church of Hastings. Uh, sorry, before I begin. Beloved congregation, uh, this evening we're going to be considering from God's word, getting the gospel right. How do we get the gospel right? And what is God's word calling us to in getting the gospel right? The school year is uh, quickly coming to a close, and it has come to a close for some. And college students will tell you about the terrors of exam time. Exams are difficult for students. And this evening we have a, a different sort of exam and a, and a different sort of question that we're faced with as we consider getting the gospel right. But we need to understand that there's nothing more important for your life, for my life, there's nothing more urgent for us to consider than this one question. One question, one question to evaluate all of your life. One question by which we can face death. And that one question is, how are you right with God? How are you right with God? Another way of asking that question would be, why should God receive you into heaven? And students, and those of us who have been school students, think about for a moment about exam preparation. You only need to answer one question to gain your qualifications. That could be a very overwhelming thing or it could be a very attractive thing. Overwhelming in the sense that it's going to touch on everything. But if you know the answer, it's a very attractive thing. Now naturally that would be a very important question. Think of, your whole, think, of the, the, think of your qualifications. Your whole future hangs on answering the one question. And the same is true for us. Our whole eternal future 
hangs on answering this one question, how are you right with God? And to answer that question this evening and every day of our lives, we need to get the gospel right. That's what the gospel is about, the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what God's word is showing us, that we need to understand this. And there's a, there's a danger that we're faced with. And as we're working through Genesis, uh, well, some time ago now, and how Genesis is revealing to us the work, the person of Jesus Christ in its elementary way, in its seed form, we can't pass up this one verse, 15 verse 6, this glorious gospel that was so strong in Abraham's life and is so important for us to understand. He believed in the Lord, and the Lord counted it to him as righteousness. There are ways to get the gospel wrong, and so we need to consider this verse. As we look at getting the gospel right this evening, there's four points that we're going to be considering. And and first of all, the challenge and we're going to be looking at this from the whole, whole teaching of Romans 4. So if you've closed your Bibles, uh, be encouraged to open them again. Uh, we, we've read the pertinent verses that we're going to be considering, and we're going to hear how God is showing us from Romans what it means that Abram was regarded as righteous, was, was counted righteous before God. So first of all, we're going to look at the, the challenge, and then, and then secondly, the characters, thirdly, the corrective, and, and fourthly, the conclusion. So there's the the challenge, the characters, the corrective, and the conclusion. But first of all, the challenge. And and Paul is very direct and very pointed. There are ways that the gospel changes. There are ways of thinking, there's ways of relating to God that changes the good news of the work of Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul is is directing our attention to in chapter 4. It's a misreading of Genesis, and therefore it's a mistaken answer. It doesn't get the gospel right. It changes the gospel. And and, and so what are these alternative answers to this question? How are you right with God? These alternatives that Paul is dealing with, is it by works? Is it by your contribution? Is it by what you've accomplished? Is it because of what you've done? Or is it by faith? And there's a danger here. You see, we get the gospel wrong, and we get this question wrong. How are you right with God? If, if Abram was justified by works, he has something to boast about. He has something to be proud of, but not before God. Before God, that's a wrong answer. And yet, it seems so attractive because Abraham was faithful. We're picking up this verse in in Genesis 15, but the dialogue with Abram was started way back in Genesis 12. God called Abram out of his out of his homeland, out of Ur, and he called him to follow. And Abram obeyed. He 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 listened to God. He loved God. He he trusted God. And the challenge is this: is this what makes Abram such a significant character? But there's such a danger in substituting. Abram was faithful, for Abram was counted righteous by faith. It wasn't what he contributed. Another way of looking at this is in in Paul's way of argumentation in in Romans, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and considering the difference in in outcomes. And, And Paul says it very directly here. Now to the one who works, his wages are not counted as a gift, but as his due. If it's Abram's faithfulness, if it's his, his trust, if it's his love, if it's Abram's character that we're celebrating, then his, his wages, his in, eternal inheritance, is no longer an, a gift, it's an entitlement to him. Was Abraham so faithful that he deserved to be right with God? So that's the challenge. Whom does God receive and how are you right with him? But then secondly, before we can answer that question, before we can understand how God's word answers that question, uh, we need to look at the characters that Paul presents us with. Paul offers examples which come from God's word. And notice as he gives these these answers and, and he draws our attention to Abram and to David, 
He's not giving his perspective on things. It's not some novel way of looking at things that, that Paul's invented. Instead, he's, he's teaching us how to listen and listen carefully to God's word. And, and notice that's his, his point in Romans 4. Don't you understand that this is the full teaching of God's word? Verse 3, for what does the scripture say? Paul isn't saying, no, no, listen to me, I've got this keen insight as to how you really need to understand the story of Abraham. And I don't know if you, you listen to others uh, today who are talking about meta-narratives, and that's the, the kind of the way that we tell stories. And everyone's got this kind of narrative where they are on their journey of life. And your journey might, is just as valid as my journey, and we all have these, these overarching perspectives on the way that we look at our journey but Paul's not saying that, thankfully. This is not some sort of meta narrative that he's trying to invent and trying to try and dig down deep. He's saying this is what Scripture says. And how easily we miss that because we overlook and we lose the wonder of grace that God is revealing in this story. That one verse that shines with all the fullness, the radiance of the gospel of Jesus. God counted righteousness to Abram. The scripture says this. Or David, David when he's penning Psalm 32, it's quoted in Romans 4, he speaks of the blessing of one whom God counts righteous, or the one to whom God counts righteousness apart from works. Verse 6. So these two characters, Abram and David, that, that God's word presents to us, the, these two legendary figures of the Old Testament, these are the father figures of the Jews and of Israel. And, and the trouble is that the Jews thought that they, because they had this connection with these father figures, that these father figures kind of guaranteed their right standing with God, if they could kind of maintain their connection with Abram, if they could maintain their connection with David, they could assume that they were right with God, that God would be pleased with them, that, dare we say it, they were entitled now to eternity with God. But that's where we, where we have to be so careful. These characters, David and Abram, they're not presented by God's word. This is not what God's word says about them. In fact, God's word says they weren't right. They weren't righteous because of their obedience. They weren't acceptable with him because of their work. And God says this in two ways. He says this about Abraham. Consider this with regard to Abraham, verse 5. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. That Abraham was, was one who believed something about God. He believed that God justifies that means that God declares to be righteous. He justifies the ungodly. That righteousness that is counted to us, it's a righteousness that, that isn't of ourselves. It's, it's an alien righteousness. It comes from the outside. It's, it's not our native language, our, our standard condition. Or moving on to David, just as David also speaks of the blessing of the one to whom God counts righteousness, apart from works. Blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count. And that word count is so important there. The Lord will not count his sin. This is why that notion of God's reckoning, of God's accounting, his method of economics, his way of working with people as he's, he's dealing with these sinners and, and these characters, it shows us not their, their worthiness, not their faithfulness, not their entitlement that they deserve. These characters are presented as people who are like you and me. They're sinners. So before we put them on some kind of a pedestal and before we uh, trace our lineage to them, God's word says, remember what they are. They're sinners. And that's why it's so important to get the gospel right. That's why you need to remember these characters. That God looks on Abram and he sees this is a man who is ungodly. He looks on David and he, he says this is a man who has considerable sin. But here's my grace. 
here's the gift. It's not an entitlement. It's a gift of grace that I bestow upon you. I will not count. I will not count you. I will not reckon you as a sinner. It's a glorious reckoning of grace. It reminds us of of how bankrupt we are in our spiritual condition. That every one of us has, has never done enough and will never do enough. And thirdly then, this leads us to the corrective. Because how do we know when we have changed the gospel, when we've twisted the gospel? I think what is presented here is something uh, that happens quite naturally in an established religion of generations. It's something that happens when we don't really reckon with who we are by nature. And we take going to church, believing in Jesus Christ, being kind of church attending people and having the church in our framework framework of thinking it's just kind of natural it's it's native it's inherent and inherited like it was with the jews and so the question is for us how do you know when you've changed the gospel it has to do with the way you look at your religious experience that your religious experience becomes rituals rather than faith Rituals that secure your righteousness. A misuse of circumcision, which we need to to correlate today and understand is a misuse of baptism. That says, because I've always been going to church, because I belong to the church, I'm just sort of kind of naturally a Christian. That we use our religious experience to claim our entitlement to being right with God. Or, or the way that we look at outcomes, your connection with a tradition. And we, uh, in our church, of course, would call it a reformed tradition. And it gives us the power to, to prevail, it gives you a theology to work through and to survive in the world of ideas. And when there's great errors around us, it gives us some kind of confidence. And, and our confidence can become that, that theological perspective rather than the God who is the focus of that theology rather than a reliance upon the God whose word teaches that theology, rather than on the promises of God. And how do you regard the outcome of your life? The promise of eternal fellowship with God, is that an entitlement? Because you have your your spiritual uh, checklist that you go through. If God would call you home tonight and say, why should I allow you into my presence? What's the first word that you're going to say? Because I've gone to church? Because I've witnessed for you? Because I've been a believer? There's only one answer, and this is the corrective. Because of what Christ has done in my place. Because in God's way of accounting, our contribution is that of bankruptcy. We are just broken and sinful. That's all we have to contribute. And then we hear the resounding promise of the gospel. That is why it depends on faith. In order that, there's a purpose that God says you have to believe, that that it's my gift to you. It's all completely of grace. It's not because you deserve it. It's not because you earn it. It's not because of some guaranteed outcome. It is all because I bestow it freely for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's why it has to depend on faith. Can you believe that gospel? It's so certain, so real and and resonant in all of God's word that it will come and be given to you solely and simply for the sake of Jesus Christ. That's why it depends on faith. And, And here's the purpose Verse 16, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his offspring. And we, we can't flip that around. We can't interchange that. We need to be really careful with this. It's received, it's possessed, it's owned, not by faithfulness, but by faith. By faith in the one who extends the promises and gives the guarantees. So our our previous standing, our current standing, our future standing, they all depend on this grace, on this God who is gracious, on the God who gives guarantees. So we've had that challenge, 
uh, those characters, this corrective, and fourthly now we're going to consider the conclusion. The covenant which God established with, with Abram, with Abram at this point in Genesis 15, the covenant by which he walked through those animals that had been cut in pieces and the promises, the promises of a land, of, uh, of offspring, they're some of the most precious revelations of the relationship that God has with his people. And we shouldn't hold back from that. We, sh- we should stand in awe of that. We need to revel in the reality that God is revealing about the covenant, that he's a, he's a God who establishes the relationship. He's the God who secures the relationship. And the promises and the certainty of the promises, dare we speak of the guarantee of these promises that are so rich and so real. But, but we need to recognise this, we need to hold on to this, that separate the promises of blessing and, and the covenant from Christ and it will be corrosive, it will be destructive, it will be deadly to the gospel and you'll get it wrong. Without Christ, the covenant and the promises destroy the gospel because Christ is the gospel, Christ is the head of the covenant. He's, he's the representative, he's the second Adam. He is the head of the covenant, and it is only in Christ who is the guarantee of all the promises that they are all yes and amen in him. So so it depends on faith, a faith in God's provision of his son and a relationship with him. And we didn't read it, but as we listen to what Paul is saying, he's developing and he's unfolding here. This is all fully realised in Jesus Christ, verse 22, Romans 4. That is why his faith was counted to him as righteousness. Because without wavering, he clung to that Christ. And and, and verse 23, but the words, it was counted to him. They weren't written for for Abram's sake alone, but for ours also. And and it will be counted to us. Here's the wonder of the covenant, the, the wonder of the promises. They will be counted to us who believe in him, who raised from the dead Jesus our Lord who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification. So he is the focus. There is no righteousness apart from Jesus Christ. A covenant without Christ just leads to presumption. It did with the Jews and it does with us. If we teach our children that they are covenant members without teaching them about the work of Jesus Christ and his death, his humiliation and his being conceived by the Virgin Mary and his being born as a man under our condition, about his his suffering and his poverty. If we teach our children that they are covenant members without teaching them about Jesus as the head of the covenant, we're setting them up, we're setting them up to twist the gospel by presumption, to say that I'm okay, I'm I'm a child of the covenant. We're not okay because we're a child of the covenant. We're okay only if we're Christ's. A promise without the guarantee of of Christ's fulfillment. And again, there is no righteousness apart from the work of Jesus Christ. And a promise without the guarantee of Christ's fulfillment will lend itself to secure the promise by our works, by our attempts, by our performance by our faithfulness, by our devotion, rather than by Christ's. And how would we know when that's happened? When we start to boast about what we've done for God. The covenant and the promises, they are the most precious revelations, only when they draw us to see that they are all yes and amen in Jesus Christ. The covenant and the promises help us to get the gospel right when they show us the wonder of what Christ has done for us. And we can respond on that day when we have this examination before the Father, and he says, why? Tell me, why should, I, should you be allowed in to my presence? And the testimony of our faith is, it's not because I deserve it. It's not because I've done something, but because Christ has done it all. That's what you've shown me in the covenant. That's what you've promised, Father. I take you at your word. This is what you've said. And he said it from Abram onwards. He said it through David. He said it through every 
faithful realization, uh, every realization, uh, every faithful child who comes to that understanding, I'm so ungodly, I need someone else. Here's the answer. How are you right with God? Only because you have said, that's what I am. You have said it in the glorious words of the gospel in Genesis 15, in the glorious words of the gospel in Romans 4, that you count as righteous those who believe in your son. That's the answer that we need to wrestle with. How are you right with God? It's a question for every day. The assurance comes not in that you can't know, not in developing some other storyline and some other narrative, but in listening and taking God at his word and saying that's what it was with Abram, that's what it is with David, that's what it is with Jesus Christ, and that's what your word teaches. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So parents, that's our calling, and people of God, covenant people of God, know the Christ, who is the yes and amen, the guarantee of the gospel, who is the gospel. Let's pray together now. Our Lord, we thank you for your word and how this story of the Old Testament points us to Jesus Christ and our great need of putting our faith in you, just as Abram and David did. Lord, when we would trust in what we have done or in what we will try to do for you or in our theology, show us that we go astray, that we turn away from the Christ when we do this. Lord, count us as righteous by faith in Jesus Christ. We don't contribute to our good standing with you. Help us to see that and to live that in faith in Jesus. In him we pray. Amen. Let's stand now and sing from uh, number 441, Not What My Hands Have Done. We've seen that Abram wasn't counted righteous before God because of his faithfulness, but rather because of his faith in God. And let's, think, let's think about that as we sing this hymn.
at this time we have an opportunity to uh, worship God with our gifts. And, and just a reminder, as this is the first Sunday of the month, there will be a, a second collection for the work of the Open Home Foundation and, and Crossroad Prison Ministries. And our deacon will come forward to collect these. <laughs> Let's uh, pray and give thanks to the Lord now. Lord, you are the provider. You are our provider. You have given us what we need. And we give these offerings in, in thankfulness for the many blessings we experience. Continue to give us our food from day to day, we pray. We pray for your blessing on the Open Home Foundation as they love and, and care for children in difficult situations. May the homes where those children go be a blessing to them. Give their carers wisdom and grace as they deal with children in difficult circumstances. Lord bless also the cross Crossroad Prison Ministry. We pray for those who are involved in taking courses that, would, that they would come to know you through their studies. We pray all these things in Jesus. Amen. Let's sing now uh, number 167. We praise thee, O God, as we give thanks. As we go from here now, let's receive the blessing of God from Numbers 6. The Lord bless us and keep us. The Lord make his face shine on us and be gracious to us. The Lord lift up his countenance on us and give us peace. Amen. As our closing song of praise now, let's uh, sing number 229, You Servants of God. <laughs> 